Right, anyone for a lunchtime derby? Because of the derby between uh, Man U and Man City, the FA Cup final, the police have uh, dictated that that will start at three o'clock and you can't have uh, that and the derby going off on ITV at the same time. So it's a lunchtime derby on ITV. It's not gone down great with everyone. Lee, what do you think of it? It's probably the least worst scenario. That's how I refer to it in the racing post. Nobody could say it's not disappointing news. It is disappointing news. But nobody has intentionally slighted the derby. You could have run the derby at the normal time, but it would have been broadcast on ITV4, which clearly would not have been satisfactory. You're then left with saying, do you run the race during halftime? A lot of people suggested that. Far too risky. You've got a very short window. Uh, a protest would scupper the plan. A horse spreading a plate might scupper the plan. And for ITV as well, they'd also be well aware that they're up against the BBC showing the FA Cup final. You go to Epsom, you use a lot of your football audience to Gary Lineker. You run the race after the derby. A lot of people like that idea. And I think there would have been people within ITV who would have been keen for that because you'd likely get a very good viewing figure. The big problem there is now the whirlpool. The whirlpool is such a critical factor yeah in the funding of the top race courses. And if you run the race at 6 p.m., that's no good for punters in Hong Kong, which means you're left with running the derby before ITV go on air the, the, for the, the FA power Cup of at Hong Kong and the power of Whirlpool over British racing is... And that, that will be... I mean, I I'd suggested in the comment piece I wrote, Nick, after um, the derby decision news, that it would be a good idea to move the Coronation Cup from the Friday mm -hmm. to the Saturday to bolster that second half of mm. what is derby day. It was suggested to me yesterday that probably wouldn't happen because the Coronation Cup would likely have a four or five runner field and for whirlpool punters, that's no good. Yeah, what do we think of that, Neil? We never, we, nobody ever mentioned Wednesday in the whole debate. Oh, they well, did. I think if they? you did, yeah. But, yeah but the oh, only sorry, you're that, taking the mickey. The only people They're that all... no, the people that mentioned it were sorry, being sorry, I was a bit sorry. slow. I was a bit no, slow nobody there. Was, nobody was no, actually there were plenty serious. of people. I've got a load of emails really? saying move the derby back to a Wednesday. Well, I mean, they could have done it for one year just because of the cup final thing, don't you think? I don't know. We've run out of time. Well, somebody suggested to me that it could go to Wednesday if it was a national holiday. Well, I'm all in favour of a national holiday. holiday. And they were trying to crowbar a national holiday in memory of the late Queen mm -hmm. and then run the derby on that national holiday. Perfect. Big ask. Perfect. Bit late as well. Tell then. you what, your government will do that, won't they? Well, it's not my government. I mean, I'm not going to be... They're, not, they're unlikely to call me up for any advice. <laughs> Power <laughs> to the people. <laughs> Socialism or barbarism. Uh, shake-up of the jumps racing pattern has happened. After a fashion, it's not massively dramatic, but it involves things like the Tolworth Hurdle going to Aintree's new Boxing Day meeting from Sandown. It involves the removal of races like the Leamington at Warwick to bolster the Classic at Cheltenham. It involves the Desert Orchid chase being turned into a limited handicap to try and introduce, uh, improve the competitiveness of that, and all sorts of other bits and pieces. Do you like that? I, I definitely like it because, you know, my general feeling is always that there's just too much racing and that, you know, we have to accept that the sport's not going to suddenly get a huge influx of money to double the prize money. So we, we need to spend the money that we've got better. Uh, I like the way that Paul Nichols got involved. Somebody obviously came up with the clever idea of trying to get a big name trainer on side and to go on the record and say this is good yeah, uh, because that might carry the others along and people that hadn't really got a strong opinion on it might think well if it's good enough for the champion it's probably good enough for me. I, 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 I thought it was quite, a, I liked the decisions they made and I thought the way they announced it was quite positive. It definitely probably kind of lays down a, a sort of expectation of what could happen in the future. And I did notice on Twitter, not always the best place to notice these things, that um, a lot of people who kind of decry the way racing is going, the second you make a change, they don't seem to want to change. They, they kind of moan about everything about racing, but then when you change something, uh, they wanted it to stay the same. I, I, I feel like we're going to have to make some changes, and, and this is a good start. Anything catch your eye here from a professional's point of view, or do you just let it roll? No, I thought it was a good idea, um, making the racing more competitive. We'll have some good clashes, hopefully. And um, I just thought one thing I thought was a little bit of a shame for Sandown to lose to Tolworth. Um, I know it's not going to be the Tolworth anymore. It's just going to be a Grade One, Two-Mile Novice Hurdle on Boxing Day. Um, but I just I, I always thought the, the Tolworth just a, a hard race to find the winner, and it normally chucks up quite a good one. So just a shame for Sandown. But um, you know, in the long run, and 
all the other races and stuff, I think it will do us um, do us a favour. Anything you particularly liked or didn't like? Uh, well, I've got an interest, Nick. I was on the College Jumps review group. I wrote the report that went to the BHA and I'm on the Jumps Passing Commission. So right. my hands are sort of all over. It's great like work. It, yeah. Great work, Lee. Thank great work. Um, uh, any complaints? Uh, Lee Motter said, here's your man. Uh, <laughs> 18 to 26 racing clubs. This is in reference to KIPCO and British Champion Series, who are letting 18 to 26s go racing for a tenner on all... 26. So I think so far they've announced that for the two days of the Guineas Festival yes. and Kipco British Champions yes. Day, it will be £10 admission. I don't think they've confirmed the admission prices for the other days, but I will be offers. Have I just cost them a fortune? <laughs> you might well have done, Nick. <laughs> they can afford it. Um, and there'll also be lots of behind the scenes activities uh, for people who sign up to this free entry club. And listen, what's not to like? Yeah. Um, we know that racing's demographic is not as youthful as perhaps the look on Sunday audience is. Um, and that in an ideal world, we would be interesting lots more young people, getting them engaged in the sport, getting them watching the sport, loving the, loving the, the horses, the jockeys, really becoming fans. Um, we've seen examples of how that can be done with student race days in Britain and Ireland that have been extremely uh, popular with those who've gone. I think this takes it to a different level. It really shines a spotlight on our best yeah. races, our best events, and I think all involved I, have to be applauded. I'd like some of that younger audience I'm seeing at jump racing festivals to be going flat racing in, Absolutely. The, in the summer. Um, Luca, you are the youngest of us here by quite some considerable margin. I'm guessing you're supportive of adventures like this. Can you easily convince your friends to go racing or not? I can, yeah, yeah. Um, just a lot of people just haven't been. Uh, that's half the problem. And like you mentioned, those student race days and stuff, There's there's been a few recently which absolutely ran-packed. Mm. Um, yeah, Warwick was absolutely pumping. Yeah, like you counted to the start and you think you're at the festival. You wouldn't know any different. And people singing and all sorts. Is, it is great. And um, they seem to be working. So, yeah, this is a, probably a good scheme. Yeah, and you can um, you can find more details about this on the Luck on Sunday TikTok account. I saw a thing. <laughs> I, saw, I, saw, I saw a thing this week about the the price of booking bands is going right up, and so the whole kind of music after racing might might be Struggle. less of a thing in the future. So you know the student stuff, uh, something needs to come in and well, replace that. That particular goose doesn't lay a golden egg every time. You've got to be really careful which band you book when for what race course. You've got to know whether they've played the local area in yeah. the last few months. You've got to understand your demographic, what's good for one yeah. part of the country, not good for the other. You know, Newmarket got it right for a long time, yeah. but it's not straightforward. Uh, this was a shame. Uh, the, the good hunter chasers in, in Britain... Uh, Premier Magic uh, and uh, Shantu Express were not allowed. Was it Shantu? Shantu Flyer, isn't it? Yes. Were not allowed to run in the in the Champion Hunter Chase at Punchestown because they're not um, trained by people with full British licences. This was a right old cock up, Lee, wasn't it? Yeah, cock up is the right way of describing it, Nick, because um, Bradley Gibbs, um, who trained and rode Premier Magic to win the the Champion Hunter Chase at Cheltenham, he um, explained this week that he had sent the horse out to Ireland early um, to, to maximise the horse's mm. chances in the race. And he'd done that because he had made a point of speaking to, to Horse Racing Ireland and just confirming that Premier Magic was eligible to run in the race. Uh, horse Racing Ireland, according to Bradley, had assured him that the horse was eligible mm. to run in the race. And then just before declarations time, um, the IHRB, the regulator of Irish horse racing, decided that he wasn't eligible to run the race because Bradley Gibbs doesn't have a full training licence with the BHA and the rule for Irish racing is that entries will only be accepted for full licensed trainers, which seems strange in relation to what should be an amateur's contest. Yes, to chase. and, and, yeah. and uh, Irish point-to-point -point handlers are allowed to have runners in British yep. hunter chases. So it's a, com it's a complete nonsense and one that needs looking at sooner rather than yeah. later. Yeah, and it seems a particular shame, as I say, because that sort of race should be the embodiment of what the amateur side of the sport is. Now, I know some might say that 
in Irish jump racing in particular, sometimes the word amateur is in inverted commas. Mm. You know, a lot of their top mm. amateur jockeys are as good as professional jockeys, yeah. and I don't imagine that everyone on the point to point and are and 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 more. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm sure that they're not doing it just for the love of it, all of them. So I think it's amateur in inverted commas, and maybe this is a, an example of that. But I'm sure it's one that, or we'd hope it's one, that having this happen this year that they will look at it for next year now does anyone want to claim credit for the next talking point because i will confess that this is this might have just passed me by in the production process i'm thinking this might be you hong kong yes so um actually the, the big race in hong kong will have taken place so far i, yes. I, I, I know lucky swainess won the sprint okay I, easily I, by I, about four lengths it, maybe someone in your ear could let us know how dubai honor got on in the in the uh, the big race oh. there but in the build-up to the big race, he won. did he win? I think he did, but I was watching watch someone out there. But he was third. All right, sorry about that. Don't worry, you got <laughs> you got you got me excited then for a minute. Lee was really Im- worried. I think Lee had a bet. If, oh. <laughs> imagine if William Haggis hadn't been in Hong Kong and he was watching and he didn't know the oh. result because oh, no. he loves luck on Sunday. Oh. And Luca had just <laughs> Luca, Luca had just told him that he, he fit. Anyway, well, so Winfried Engelbert Brashkis, um, yes. the chief exec of the Hong Kong Jockey Club and most powerful racing executive in the world by a by country miles. mile. Yeah. I was there at the Asian Racing Conference this year in February in Australia, by the way. <laughs> um, and other racing no, right, I around the world pretty much bowing down before him. There's reverence toward. Uh, Winfred Engelberg Breschke, such has been his success in Hong Kong. And he was saying uh, to my colleague Andrew Dietz this week that one of his disappointments is that the interest among uh, British owners and trainers for the top Group 1 contests for which they're available uh, in Hong Kong hasn't been great in recent seasons. Now, we did have Dubai Honour running at Sha Tin today, but there was no British representation in the international races um, in December. Winfred said that he would be expecting significant prize money rises yeah. for the Hong Kong races in December. And I think that just underlines um, the extent to which, particularly that second half of the year and the, and the autumn in particular, the focus on those top international prizes and the competition now that exists between them with Australia, Racing Victoria trying to boost the prize money for races like the Cox Plate because they know they're in competition with the Hong Kong races who are in competition with the Breeders' Cup. And it underlines as well that however much yeah, we try and boost Sydney prize money... Competition with Melbourne. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It, 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 it's, it's these top British races, they can't compete with those. And really, so there's nothing that, that Joe Sorbonne Smith will be able to well, do the, through levy reform. Levy reform's reform, only going to get us another 25 million. Yeah. Won't worry, Winfred. It certainly won't do that in a couple of races. <laughs> Ted Walsh has stepped down from his role as a, an analyst on RTE Racing. He's been doing that for 40 years. He has been an incredible force in, in Irish racing for, for much of that time. And he was very, very emotional yesterday in, I think, springing a bit of a surprise. Um, Jane Mangan was, was hosting the show. Uh, he... I, I did think, Lee, shall I ring Ted and get him on the show? I thought, no, he's just said he wants to retire from doing <laughs> TV, so I can't do that. We can just say, thanks for the ride. What a superb, what a superb service he has given to um, television viewers of horse racing in Ireland. Sadly, over here, we don't get to see Ted yeah. on TV very much. There was a period when he used to appear on Channel 4's Cheltenham coverage, yeah. and he was a great addition. If I can tell you one little story, Nick, last year... Um, I was on here uh, the day after the, the Saudi Cup, and, and you know I've got reservations about that, that whole fixture, and I expressed that at the start of, of the programme. Now, that's not always a great thing to do in horse racing. Brilliant booking by the producer, wasn't it? <laughs> it was, yeah. I, he knew I was flying in I from Saudi Arabia. I did make point that, as a, particularly as a gay man, I have reservations <laughs> about the, the, the Saudi regime, and I expressed that at the top of the programme. Now, in, in horse racing, rocking the boat is not often seen to be a good thing. But following that appearance, I had one phone call from a racing figure, and it was Ted Walsh. And he wasn't ringing to say, I agree with your position on this. I don't know what his position on that is. But he said, I love the fact that you were willing to say what you thought about that subject. And I thought what that showed you was that Ted Walsh's position on these things Mm. is that sincerity is everything. Say what you think. Now, sometimes, as he said himself, that has landed him in hot water. But viewers of RT Racing have always known that when they hear Ted Walsh, 
There's no, there's no guff. He's not, he's not pretending to believe something. Yeah. He says what he thinks, and I think sincerity in that sort of role is everything. And he has embodied it for four decades. Yeah, the, the diplomatic cause loss was television's gain, and in spades as well. Uh, Ted Walsh has decided uh, that that is that after four decades. Um, together with Robert Hall for much of that at the helm of, uh, of RTE Racing. What a great duo uh, they were. Um, the King has a runner next week in the 2000 Guineas on his do, do coronation we have, Do we have to, do we have to stand? The, do we need to stand well, at this point? Or? We will. You can do what you want. <laughs> Socialism <laughs> is... Yeah, so, it, it looks like we will have a, a royal runner. Slip of the pen. Slip of the pen. Who was an impressive winner, wasn't he? At John Kempton. Gosden. Yeah. Now, uh, John, if anyone can pull off training the king and the queen yeah. consort a it's, winner on coronation day you fancy great the, john gosden yeah john um, gosden, don't you? The, the indications had been that he wasn't that keen on the idea he'd been he, he it was suggested to him that the guineas might be a, an option for the horse but he kept talking about the st james's palace stakes who the king said <laughs> oh, <laughs> john so gosden said. i was thinking that i was the like king oh. is yet to hear many racing post <laughs> <new> stories <laughs> with, with quotes but john was looking towards the st james's palace presumably via the heron stakes yeah. um at sandown but he worked Did at newmarket <laughs> is that part of your repertoire he worked at <laughs> oh, this program's gonna get cancelled <laughs> do, do ronnie corbett come on <laughs> Um, but Ronnie said, no, John, um, John Gosden had been talking about the St. James's Palace stakes. The horse worked at Newmarket on Thursday under James Doyle. Apparently worked well. Not everyone had thought that he would necessarily be in love with, with the Roly Mile or quick ground given um, his action. I, I watched a really interesting piece with Ken Peterson on ITV. He was dissecting the horse's action. But um, the talent is clearly there. And there could be... No better um, headline for the sport than the king well, winning the 2000 game. On, 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 on a serious point, though, like, is that? Do you think that is a real thing? Do you think like would that be just massive for the sport, or is that just totally overdone? Oh, no, I think, think like? it'd be a big deal. I think it would certainly get into news coverage mm. on the day. I mean, we're not expecting uh, the king and the queen consort to be watching from the Rolly Mile on Saturday afternoon. Um, but you'd hope that in a quiet moment they might just flick the telly on uh, and watch what's happening at 4.40 on Saturday, slip of the pennies in the guineas. I think, I think they will. Yeah. I think they'll be And you would have a chance, wouldn't it? It's, it's, uh, it's that both the guineas look pretty open affairs at the moment. Some way for John Gosden to break his guineas duck, wouldn't it? Yeah. Training a, training a royal winner of the race. We'll be talking about another key guineas contender later in the show, and you'll, you'll see a sparkling workout as well. I can promise you something pretty sensational. Right, those were this week's talking points. Watch live racing now on racingtv.com.